our old tyres and therefore yeah. we've got to be a wee bit cautious about these things. Yeah. They're going to have to be a wee bit replaced, don't they? Well, we've got The brakes performed far better than anticipated and the driver locked the wheels up on the car. He went for, I think it was a 60 yard skid and in doing that he's gone through the tyres and they burst. Problems do occur. As I say, we've been here before with uh, with land speed record cars, and all you do is go back, look at the problem, answer it, put it right, go out again. That's all you do. Okay. Yeah. See you tomorrow. Well, that's forty ball now. <laughs> For Glyn Bowsher and Andy Green, there still seemed a long way to go. Right, folks, uh, we want three good runs today, and if we can pull this off, then that actually finishes the driving schedule, and that's a fantastic achievement. By September the 28th, the project was way behind schedule. Each and every member of the team knew that the car had to run today. Comfortable to start with. What I want to do on the first run is we'll do exactly the same thing, but kick in more power about two, three seconds earlier, find out whether it surges. So keep a good eye on the car. If anybody sees a surge, then make a note of exactly what you saw that the engine blows now afterwards. If we do get a surge, I'll pull it back rather than taking a chance of damaging the engines. And that will establish exactly where the minimum speed is. Jerry? No, nothing else is fine. Just don't break it. <laughs> <laughs> Thrust had done it. And not only that, Andy Green had used the extra power of the afterburner as well. I was just uh, watching absolutely gobsmacked. It looked absolutely terrific. Four years ago, I wouldn't have even expected the car to be built. There were so many, so many technical problems we had to overcome. Uh, that's very satisfying indeed. Now I've just done the full proving the afterburners work. 0 to 200 miles an hour in about 10 seconds, which the last second, the full afterburner lit at 150 miles an hour, 150 to 190 in one second. Tremendously exciting feeling as the car surges forward. And it's just then monitoring the afterburner nozzles to make sure that as the nozzles are lighting, I'm not going to exceed 200 miles an hour. So it's a very, very busy two to three seconds as I actually select afterburner and it starts to engage. The SSC is now operational. We're ready to go to Jordan. The thrust team were on the move. 80 tonnes of equipment and 25 personnel were squeezed into a giant Antonov 124 aircraft. And at 6.15 a.m. on October the 26th, Thrust was at last on her way to Jordan. The Al Jafra Desert in southern Jordan. The scene was set for Thrust's high-speed test runs. But the first task for all the team was fodding. Fodding is the noble art of walking the entire 10-mile track and picking up every single stone. If anything were to enter an engine at speed, the results could be catastrophic. No one is excused this chore, and strangely enough, no one seems to mind. It's very, it's a very rewarding and restful activity, you know. <laughs> the rest of the time, you know, you're under extreme stress, but here you've got a situation where you can just totally relax and just wander along. It's very pleasant. This blissful peace was about to be shattered. From now on, Thrust would be in the spotlight wherever she went. Noble's vision was now public property.
At last, thrust was on the desert, the surface she was designed for. For the first time, her unique wheels rolled on the sand. Yes, it's a great moment. Uh, the uh, famous wheels are actually on the desert. And it's most uh, gratifying to see they don't sink in too far. And so, on the afternoon of November the 13th, 1996, Thrust made her first ever high-speed run across the desert. circus had begun. From now on, the world's press would be hungry for thrust news. Every run she made would be analyzed, every delay questioned, every mistake chronicled. All right, gentlemen, well, that was the first run. The, uh, the run profile was to accelerate to just over 100 miles an hour, slow down, find out how hard the surface was then accelerate up to about 200, 220 miles an hour, and it can right. up to a little over 300 miles an hour. The problem is, of course, the light was getting very bad, and there was dust starting to stick to the windscreen, which during the day is not a problem, but it was actually uh, right at dusk. Uh, to play on the safe side, I could still see the line, but I thought, if it gets any worse, it'll be difficult, so I'll stop now. So it was just under 300 miles an hour. Andy? 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 Up here. But Andy Green had not told the whole story. Just to the right of yeah, the you see it rear wheel tracks. Yeah, just about make it up coming up through here. Yeah, I felt the, the bump. I mean, it's exactly like an aeroplane going over a rough bit of runway. You can actually feel the bump. And uh, I knew at that stage it was getting too bumpy. And the, the option was, did the car settle down or did I stop the run? And in fact, because it was still bumpy beyond this and the, uh, the, the bumping didn't dampen out sufficiently, this was the stage I aborted the run. Legally, the car here was actually not a land speed record car because it was running on two wheels and the rules are quite explicit, four wheels. Um, what appears to have happened is the wheels of the car have come into this area. The surface has collapsed somewhat, being friable, so the wheels have ploughed in. They've come up to a, a harder surface and they've literally bounced. So the back end of the car has left the ground for maybe 25 metres and if you look up there, you can see where, that it imp where it impacts the ground again with quite a wallop. And it's ploughed back into the surface, whereas it's come back down on hard onto the surface of the desert. In the pit support trailer, the telemetry readouts had confirmed what was seen on the track. The event that disturbed the quiet car on, during a run appears quite clearly on the data, and it's a hell of a shock. Something like five tons. Minus 200, 100, 70, 20, going up more. Armed with this new information, Jerry Bliss was able to alter the suspension to suit the desert surface. Meanwhile, the Royal Jordanian Army was resurfacing the track. All was now set for the next run, planned for the following day. but they were to be disappointed. Well, as you discover with, rec with record breaking, there's just one thing which you've got absolutely no nothing of an influence, which is of course the weather. What's happened here is we've got the car ready to go, but the reality is that we've, um, we've got a high wind now and we simply can't win. So we're going to stand down tonight and we're going to be on standby for tomorrow morning. Let's hope we get some the wind has died by then. Noble's wish was granted as the team took to the desert once more. Uh, 
Right, we've got the car up. Uh, the weather conditions still a bit on the windy side, which, um, well, we're going to learn about the crosswind conditions that this car can cope with. Uh, we're set up for a decent high-speed run, so um, this is very important. It's the run in which we actually prove the car. It's good. Everybody feels well. You know, there's a high level of morale, and I think we're going to get a good run. This is the uh, currently very calm wind, but it is gusting up to 10, 11 mile an hour. SSC, Roger, I will be on my guard. SSC's ready to roll. had done it. At 330 miles per hour, Thrust was well and truly on her way. Bit of excitement at last. Yeah. Filmed it with my own camera as it took off, and it really did go. Left a big cloud of dust. It was nice. It went very well. We were really, really pleased. We had two choices for the suspension. We could go softer, we could go harder. We went, opted for softer, and it, it worked. It was a lot, lot better. The tracks were apparently very, very good. Andrew's teeth are still in his head, and it was very good. The suspension's much, much smoother. The, the car is really, really smooth. And the steering is absolutely sweet. We ran in today the limiting crosswind as much as we reckoned the car could take. And you could feel the car drifting off every now and then. I just put the steering correction in, drifted it back onto the line, no problem at all. Finished up maybe 10, 12 feet maximum off the line, which at 300 miles an hour is a very small error. So very, very pleased with the way the car performed. Thrust made just one more run in Jordan that year before bad weather forced them to abandon their plans. April 1997. Thrust stood resplendent in her new black livery. Richard Noble hoped her fortunes would change to complement her new look. Well, we've had a very, very tough time. We didn't do very well in Jordan. We got our car up to 330 odd miles an hour. And um, then as you know, we got wiped out. We then came home. We'd had a, a mother and a father a problem of basically trying to keep the project going, keeping the finance coming. Uh, it's very, very hard indeed. But gradually we began to pull ahead and during this time we've been able to um, get the car painted, which is, uh, which is great. Glyn Bauscher had also modified the rear wheels. Instead of a single keel, he felt that two might give the car more stability on the hard Jordanian desert bed. May saw the thrust team back in Jordan. They immediately made a series of high-speed runs, each one edging closer and closer to their goal. On June the 5th, Andy Green took thrust faster than she had ever been before. He reached 540 miles per hour. Right, little swing. 